bless you. Bless you, Joe. Bless you, Naomi. Bless you. Bless you, Uncle Ray. Absolutely. It's worship, not performance. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly that. And I might do anything. Oh, yeah, she, she is. That's fine. Kind of you have yeah. whisper. I might do anything. Because I have a good performance. You have a good yeah, band. Yeah. I'm used to you. I'm used to you. I just follow you. I just follow you. I'm like Joe Michael. I'm, I'm a bit different. unpredictable. Yeah. No, but I quite like that, though. <laughs> but again, it's worship, not music. And, and not and not performance. Yeah, and that's right. And performance is different. Because yeah. worship is yeah. really quite loud. Yeah. yeah. Really quite loud. It's all good. Follow you. Yeah. It's good to follow you. I can give you mine. Good morning and welcome to our Good Friday service here at St. Barnabas, our Good Friday Worship at the Cross service. You're really welcome to have come and joined us for worship this morning on this really important day. So if you're at the back and you're just getting your uh, cup of coffee or cup of tea, why don't you come in and find yourselves a seat a welcome as well to all of those who are watching online and joining us for this. We hope that you also meet with the Lord today. Now, we're going to spend time today together at the cross. We do that every time that we meet. We recognize that we are a cross-shaped and cross-formed community. We know that as a church, that the sacrifices, Jesus was at the center and remains at the center of everything in which we have hope. And yet Easter, or more specifically, these few days in the lead up to Easter, give us the chance as a church each year to step slowly through the story of Jesus' gift to us. Today, while we call it Good Friday, we know that there was an awful lot that actually might be better described as painful Friday, hurting Friday, aching and longing and yearning Friday. And we know a bit about what that's like in our lives as well. So as we come to worship on this Good Friday, I'm not going to stop calling it that. We can allow that to be present with us in our minds and our hearts as we come to the cross. Because we know that Jesus walked much of that road with us. And that he did it for us. How this service is going to work, we're going to spend a lot of time in worship. We're also going to spend a lot of time with the word. We're going to spend time with meditations on scripture and have the chance to respond. 
But I'd love to invite you at the beginning of this to stand. I'm going to pray over us and invite the Lord to meet with us at the beginning, at the outset, as we intend for him to meet with us throughout. And we're going to begin to sing to him in worship. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you. Jesus, we draw near to you and we draw near about your cross this morning. And we do that because we want to remember. We do that because we want to look to you. And we do that because we want to worship you. Our king, even a king on a cross. So Lord, would you open our hearts to you this morning? Would you draw near to us as we draw near to you? Come, Lord Jesus. Struck 
It was my cross you bore So I could live In the freedom you died for And now my life is yours And I will sing Of your goodness forevermore Worthy is your name Jesus Jesus
Think about what Jesus did. Look to the Lamb. Look to the Lamb. See the Son of God, the Savior crucified. See the crown of thorns, the nails, his wounded side. He is worthy. Look to the See the one who is forever glorified. There is love and there is fire in his eyes. He is worthy. He is worthy. You are worthy.
Please be seated. The Gospel according to Luke, chapter 22, verses 39 through 46. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping? he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Why are you sleeping? Jesus asks. Late at night, after dinner, Jesus takes his disciples up to the Mount of Olives, to a garden in Jerusalem, a quiet place where they can all pray. He gives a really simple instruction, but he's earnest. Pray that you will not fall into temptation. Then he goes off on his own. Father, 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 as Chris prayed for us, as Chris read for us on his knees, if you are willing, would you take this cup away from me? An angel appears, it gives him strength, but the strength only gives him the opportunity to pray in an increased way in his anguish. He prays and the scriptures say that sweat fell as if it were big drops of blood down to the ground. He knew, didn't he? He knew. He knew that in the face of what he was to endure, what he was about to suffer, that there was a temptation that loomed more than any other. That in the face of pain, he would shy away from it. That in the face of the hardship, he wouldn't keep going. We know, because of this, that he didn't fall in this trial. Hebrews 12, verse 2 says this, For the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross, despising its shame, and sat down at the throne of God. Consider him the writer to the Hebrews says, who endured such opposition from sinners so that you would not grow weary or lose heart. But in the garden, as great drops of sweat or blood drip down, landing onto the floor, 
I imagine with great cinematic thuds. Jesus knew what was to come and what it would take to endure. It seems maybe the disciples didn't. Whether it's the after effects of dinner or the busyness of the week or the failure to recognize the signs of the moment or even as the scriptures suggest that they're overwhelmed with sorrow. They recognize the signs of the moment and they just can't take it. When Jesus returns to his disciples, they're asleep and Jesus is incredulous. Why? Why are you sleeping? Now, I don't know about you, but I like my sleep. We all know that sleep's important. We all agree, don't we? It's good to get your sleep, to get your eight hours. But do we not realize that there's something bigger happening here? And Jesus repeats himself. He repeats his instruction to the disciples. Get up and pray that you do not fall into temptation. So as our first response, I'd like to invite you to stand. As Jesus said to get up. And we're going to spend a moment praying for ourselves in our following of Jesus. That even in this time of drawing near to the cross and over this Easter weekend, but also throughout our lives, that we would stay awake, that we would stay alert. And that we would pray that as hardship comes, as opposition looms, as things test and try us in our walk with Jesus, that we would not fall into temptation. I'm going to pray over us now. And you are welcome to pray in whatever way you would like, whether that means speaking the words aloud, whether that means praying them quietly in your heart. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you that at that time and in that hour of the greatest import, you put aside time to pray and your prayer and the prayer that you asked of your disciples was that we would pray that we would not be led into temptation. Lord, as we face temptation of many kinds, as we face distraction, as we face challenge, as we face hardship, and brokenness or the consequences of the hardship and brokenness of others. Lord, we ask that you would lead us not into temptation, but that you would deliver us from evil. Jesus, we place ourselves in reliance upon you in order to be able to stand at any distance from your amazing work for us on the cross. We recognize that we're only here this morning by your grace and that we only stand before you or have the chance to follow you because of the great mercy that you lavish upon us. So Lord, would you hem us in on every side would you protect us and would you guide us and would you keep us from temptation today, tomorrow and always. Amen. Amen. We're going to continue to worship.
Everything I once held dear, I count 
lead me to the cross Please be seated Luke 22, verses 47 to 62. While he was speaking, a crowd came up, and the man who called Ju Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was happen going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, No more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, and the elders who had come for him, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour when darkness reigns. Then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. And when some, of the, and when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard, and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, This man was with him, but he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, Certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. A crowd approached Jesus in the garden. And they were armed. Betrayal might normally start, we think with finger pointing and accusations. But here, as it does sometimes, it started with a kiss. Judas. Judas, the man who'd followed Jesus and helped and served. Who had seen what all of the others had seen, the healings, the miracles, the incredible teaching but who, it seems, had harbored a desire for who Jesus would be that ultimately morphed into cynicism. There's a short scuffle. But Jesus doesn't want his disciples to fight for him. He's giving himself over. And the king of kings gives his permission. He says to them, this is your hour when darkness reigns. When darkness is king. Our story continues in the dark. As those who follow Jesus disperse in fear, Peter tries to stay close hanging around the courtyard of the high priest's house. He is challenged repeatedly. You look like one of those who was with Jesus. Weren't you with him? 
aren't you from Galilee? The surprise, the shock, the fear, all of it challenges Peter. Peter, who was always so passionate, always the first to push himself forward. Peter, whose passion turned so quickly to denial. And then the rooster crows. So, cynicism turns to betrayal. Passion, oh dear, it can turn to denial. I wonder where, as we come in today, around the cross, we find ourselves. Have we held vision for a better world with Jesus, but by time, maybe by disappointment, that has morphed or even taken on the shadow of cynicism? Do we maybe analyze and measure more than we trust and we hope? Or maybe we find ourselves with Peter, passionate almost to a fault, always willing to fling ourselves out of a boat, keen to speak up for our own radical love of the Lord. But when the test comes, when the challenge or our passion is confronted, we are quick to deny or to minimize or to hide. It's right that we spend some time before the cross today in response to all that Jesus has done, in repentance. We know that we have all missed the mark, that we've all had moments and allowed our hearts to turn towards things which weren't of his will. So I'm going to invite us to spend a moment asking the Holy Spirit whether there's anything that we need to lay before him today. And then I'll lead us in turning our back on that and turning our eyes towards his cross again. Holy Spirit, would you come? We invite you here. Spirit, would you come into our hearts? And would you illuminate for us anything that sits in them that's not of you? Would you particularly shine your light on cynicism? Would you particularly shine your light on false passion that would not endure? Now, if you feel him drawing anything to light, you can just say to him that you're sorry. We're sorry, Lord. We're sorry where we don't follow you as we ought. We're sorry where our hearts are divided. We're sorry where we fall asleep. And we're sorry where our intentions and our desires and our purposes don't align with yours when we're awake. And Lord, we choose to turn back to you and back to your cross. And we thank you that when we confess our sins, you are faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us and that we rely on the hope of the cross for that. So just receive his forgiveness now.
as well. Know that for you, this is not the day that darkness reigns. Because his light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. Jesus, we turn to you. Jesus, we thank you. Jesus, we bless you. Amen. We're going to stand once more and continue to worship him. Take a seat. <clears throat> Luke 22, verse 63 to 23, 25. The men who were guarding Jesus began mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him and demanded, prophesy who hit you. 
and they said many other insulting things to him. At daybreak, the council of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and the teachers of the law, met together and Jesus was led before them. If you are the Messiah, they said, tell us. And Jesus answered, if I tell you, you will not believe me. And if I asked you, you would not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. They all asked, are you then the Son of God? He replied, you say that I am. And then they said, why do we need any more testimony? We've heard it from his own lips. And then the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, we have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Messiah, a king. So Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. And then Pilate announced to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they insisted. He stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. For what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform a sign of some sort. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there vehemently accusing him. And then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him. Dressing him in an elegant robe, they sent him back to Pilate. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they'd been enemies. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, and said to them, you brought this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I've examined him in your presence, and I found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. As you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. But the whole crowd shouted, away with this man, release Barabbas to us. Now Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. For the third time, he spoke to them, why what crime has this man committed? I found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and then release him. But with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified. And their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will.
mockery. That is what we heard. Mockery. Mockery conditions the whole response of Jesus' trial. They blindfolded him, the scriptures say, and beat him and asked him to prophesy who it was that dealt the blow. Tell us who hit you. But in the midst of that mockery, they also asked a question that we all need an answer to. Are you the Messiah, they ask? Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus refuses to answer. He says, if I tell you, you would not believe me. He says, you say that I am. It's curious, isn't it? But I think it's because Jesus knows that the questions aren't serious. They're just an extension of the mockery. They aren't interested or inquiring because they're considering the right response to who Jesus is. And that would be worship. They're considering whether he's upsetting the apple cart. They're considering whether he's challenging existing orders and hierarchy and the delicate power balance between a Roman governor and a Jewish client kingdom. He's sent back and forth between these political powers, a plaything of the powerful, dressed up in elegant robes, as a joke. And when the decision is handed over to the mob, they release a rebel and a murderer, while the only man who had never sinned was condemned to die. Are you the Messiah? Are you the king? For us today, gathered round this cross, knowing the path that Jesus would walk for us, I wonder, can we, in the midst of that, declare him king? Do we recognize him? Or do we feel unlike it seems Pilate himself, that more testimony is needed. When we look at him in our mind's eye, dressed in the robes, not of glory, but of mockery, I wonder what we say in our hearts. We could respond. I've got a slide for this. We could respond like this, like the people did then. Jesus, crucify him. But I don't think we want to respond like this. And I think that in the midst of today, there's a subversive power in us claiming our king in the midst of his mockery. Maybe we want to respond like this other slide. Jesus is our king. A king who we know walked this path of mockery for us. Who ultimately gave his life for us. How do you want to respond. If you'd like to respond like this, I'd love to lead us in doing that. So why don't you stand with me?
And when I say Jesus, we'll say, we'll need those words still up, although I'm sure they're all in your minds. When I say Jesus, we'll say is our king. Okay? Jesus is our king. 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 king. Hallelujah. We're going to praise him some more.
Please be seated. As the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. And Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. And then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us and to the hills, cover us. For if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. And when they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself, if he's God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And there was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him and said, don't you fear God, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we're getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon for the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two and Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he said this, he breathed his last. The centurion seeing what had happened praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. Now there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man who had not consented to their decision and action. He came from the Judean town of Arimathea, and he himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. Then he took it down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and placed it in a tomb, cut in the rock, one in which no one had yet been laid. It was preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. Then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes, but they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment. Jesus is mocked. Jesus is beaten. Jesus is tried. And somewhere along, his strength is tested so much that as they march him up the hill to die, they have to grab a bystander, a man called Simon, 
to carry his cross for him. When they put him up on the cross, he hangs there beside two criminals. And there's a sign that what's going on is not just a tragedy for those who knew him or a tragedy for he himself, but that this is a moment of cosmic significance. It's as if the sun itself has puttered out, guttered like a candle without any more power to shine. And yet throughout this story, we also see signs of something else entirely occurring. Signs that this king who we've proclaimed today was somehow yet in the midst of his greatest suffering, entering in triumph into, by this very act, the power and majesty of his kingdom. Women weep for him as he goes up the hill. He is noticed and he is mourned. The criminals who hang on either side, one of them notices this thing that is happening. Remember me, he says, when you come, when you come, when you come into your kingdom. Even the centurion, a man who was used to death, a man who knew it was to see someone's life end, a man who knew what it was to put an end to a person's life. Even that man, looking up at the cross, said, surely this man has done nothing wrong. But then it was done. And Jesus, his body lifeless, was laid in a stone tomb. And preparations as much as they were able to be made were made of the body. But then that process was interrupted. Wanting to follow the Jewish Sabbath, the men and the women who had lingered even there to the last by the tomb itself, stepped away. A stone was rolled across the entrance and they headed off into the gathering night. And that's the end of our Friday story. As a church, we've been spending some time pressing into the practice of silence in prayer over the last few months. And I wanted to invite us, as we've come to the end of telling our Friday story, to spend some time now in silence. Allow all of the things that have been said, all that you have sung and all that you have prayed to revolve around your mind and your heart as we meditate on how Jesus gave his life for us. Jesus, as we are quiet, Would you come? Jesus in the silence, would you meet with us?
Let's stand together and sing in worship for one final time.
So Jesus, this Good Friday, as we remember and we recognize your sacrifice for us, would we receive you and your kingdom in all of the fullness with which you desire for us? Amen. Amen. I would like to make an invitation. If you feel and you've been part of this service today, but that you have never come before Jesus and said, Lord, I want you to be my saviour and I recognise what you did for me on the cross. I want you to be my Lord and follow you in my life. If that would be you and you would say that about yourself, then do please come down to the front. Say hi to me afterwards. Um, We'll have a a small team who would be willing to talk with you about what that means and to pray for you so that you can receive the life of Jesus for yourself. And we will celebrate that with you because it's so important to say, Friday is here, church, but Sunday is coming. Hallelujah. We would love to invite you to come and join us in the other things that we have going on over this weekend. We have messy church this evening for those families, particularly with younger children um, or those that you know with younger children who would like to come. Please do invite them. That starts at um, 5.30. Then the Easter Saturday walk. It doesn't say that on the screen, but it starts at 11 o'clock. We're meeting here at 11 o'clock. And please bring a picnic because it's going to be glorious weather isn't it? And we're going to head on a walk around our local area, praying for the area, and then ending up in a park where we can have a bit of a picnic together. And then Easter Day is coming. Sunday's coming, folks. And um, you can see all of the details there. Our normal pattern of services, also our 6 um, a.m. and 10 p.m. Zoom prayer meetings, which you don't know about the details, on the door. By the way, out there is the Zoom details. Um, We would love for you to join us and we'd love for you to bring as many as you can to celebrate the risen Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So bless you. Um, Have a wonderful rest of your day. And as a reward, a heavenly reward for the meditation and what we've done, there are hot cross buns at the back on plates. I don't know if they're being handed round or not, but please do stay for fellowship and hot cross buns. Bless you all. Bless you all.